Malcolm, I know when you, in, in 1993 when you were being interviewed to come to Rice, you were already at a very good uh, institution. What was it about Rice that attracted you to come? What was it about its promise that you felt this was the kind of place that you wanted to spend the next decade of your life? I wish all the questions were that easy. Uh, there are several things. Okay, first, you understand I turned down two firm offers to be president elsewhere and uh, discouraged a bunch of others that, 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 that did not see a fit, including my alma mater. Uh, but about Rice, several things. First, I knew about Rice from having had collaborators here. Charles McClure and I worked very closely in the 60s and the 70s on our public joint public finance work. So I knew a lot about Rice from that. Uh, second, because I had commissioned a study myself when I was dean of the faculty at Duke to try to figure out how we were going to change science at Duke so as to get it up to speed, because it wasn't. Okay, We didn't have any science departments ranked in the top 30. We had half of one department called botany, uh, botany zoology, but uh, we really needed to do something. So I was right in the middle of that review when I started talking to the search committee and to the board, and it was very clear to me that Rice had it right on science. That if you're not doing science in an interdisciplinary fashion, you're not doing science for the 21st century, or the late 20th century. And it seemed to me that Rice was of a size and of a disposition to do it right, and I thought maybe I could help. And I knew that, that Rice was better prepared, uh, more prepared than any other institution I knew to do science right, but also there was this interdisciplinary uh, uh, tradition here that is not confined to science and engineering, but it, but extends over the entire university. And I thought I wanted to be a part of that because I do believe that this is the this is the these these intersections of of, of disciplines are where we're going to see some of the really most important uh, advances in in ideas and knowledge. Well, after you got to Rice and uh, began to learn about the place, I mean, nearly every institution, there's a difference between sort of reality mm -hmm. and image and perception. After you got here and you got to know the place better, what did you think in early 90, 93 or early 94, what seemed to you to be the most pressing problems facing Rice at the beginning of your administration? Strengthening and enlarging the faculty, uh, trying to do something about what I consider to be uh, a a physical plant in science, engineering, humanities, above all, uh, and I don't, I don't say that for your benefit, my views on that were well known, and in other areas as well, we, ha we had to get, we had to uh, bring about physical facilities at Rice that were at least as good as the quality of the faculty and students, and I would not say that that was so in 93, and the board agreed with that. And we knew we were going to have to do something. And we knew we were going to have to do something about strengthening the faculty. And we did. You know, and you've got the numbers. I'm not going to right. go through like a commissar right. yeah. about no, this no, no, increase no. in square feet and increase right. in number of faculty. This right. is all there. Right. Well, this, this, this question may almost answer itself. But, I mean, you've identified what you saw as the major problems. Thinking back over the last 11 years, uh, what would you say being reflective and analytical what do you consider your major, what accomplishments at Rice that you've made are you most proud of? You have to understand one thing. If you'll read the material I've been sending right. you, you will not see me or my or I anywhere except when I mention David Lieber. Right. Okay? So we can't talk about my achievements. It really is these deans and these vice presidents and this board and this faculty. Okay? So as long I'll say that once, and I won't say it again. So if you ask me again, I'll, I'll, hark, I'll say harken back to my observations. Well, I'll so, rephrase it and say this. What accomplishments at Rice over the last 11 years are you most proud of? Gosh, there's, there's so much that has happened. And certainly it is a changed institution. There's no question about that. We're all, will time prove all the changes to have been highly beneficial? Time will tell, okay? Time will tell. I think probably so, but, uh, you know, we have to leave that to others to assess after a few years because you can't, you, you can't tell sometimes right after the fact. But there's so many things, John, I don't even know how to rank them. I'll just start 
the kind of stream of consciousness as I have been up since 315. One thing I knew that we, we had to do when I came here was to better integrate Rice with the Texas Medical Center. I came from a university in which arts and sciences and engineering were inadequately hooked to a really great medical enterprise and vice versa. And there are a lot of institutional reasons for that, bad ones and, and, and good ones. Uh, a lot of suspicion uh, on both sides of the of the campus at, at, at Duke the medical school, you know, being just north of the chemistry building, and then it's everything else north of there. Um, and I knew that we had to do something because I, it, it, given our size and given what I knew were the requirements of 20th century and 21st century uh, science and engineering, we could never hope for lasting distinction in the life sciences without active, thoroughgoing collaboration with the Medical Center. And I said, when I, my first day on campus, I started that. And I started talking to the faculty. I found the same kind of, of wariness among our faculty as I had found at Duke. Uh, but I had learned a thing or two about what you do about that. And with the help of some really good deans like Kathy Matthews and some good, and, and Sid Burris and, and Michael Carroll and good provosts, and uh, uh, all of my provosts, uh, uh, we set about to change that, and we have. There's just no question about it. Uh, our standing with our colleague, with our much larger colleagues in the medical center, is today very great. We are making an impact. We have over 85 joint programs in teaching and research and service with the institutions of the Texas Medical Center. Uh, half of those are with Baylor, but our Involvement with MD Anderson, which I think is at least as good as Sloan Kettering as a cancer center in the world, and I would say, having been a patient there myself, successful, uh, maybe even better. I'm a little biased. And of course, UT Health Science Center is making great strides under Jim Willerson. So we all got to be proud of that because this is really going to position us in the life sciences and and uh, in 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 biotechnology and uh, in, in related areas. A second, and I don't mean to start with science, but uh, now that I've just been talking about biotechnology, that naturally the way my brain works leads me to think about nanotechnology and nanoscale science. The very first problem that I faced when I came here was the prospects of losing what I consider to be a certain Nobel laureate in the future. Uh, that would be Rick Smalley. He had firm offers from Berkeley and from Princeton. And this came up in October, early October of my very first year. And it was very clear that absent some, some major uh, efforts, we were going to lose him. And it was, it, at one point, I had a call uh, from the president of University of California, Berkeley, who I knew very well. And he said, Malcolm, you know you're going to lose him. Why don't you throw him to us instead and don't let Princeton get him? I said, you just wait. I went to the board. Uh, first, first, I talked to all my colleagues around the country in science that I knew. My, my dear friend, Philip Griffith, who was head of the Institute for Advanced Study, a very eminent mathematician. I talked to them about the future of nanoscale science and where that was going, because there was a lot of hype about nanoscale science and nanotechnology. And I, th I thought I understood what was important, but I wanted to test the waters with several friends across the country at Princeton and at Caltech and others. And all of them said, You've got a real great opportunity. It's a risky thing, but it could pay off big. And if you, but, but, and you're going to lose a certain Nobel laureate if if you don't do this anyway. So I went to the board, and Charles Duncan was the chair. But the whole board listened to me, and decided uh, I put my whole presidency on the line. Uh, I said, if we build it, they will come. And by that I meant the New Dell Butcher Hall, and it was about thirty-two million dollars. I don't know where we were going to get the money, and the board didn't know either, but we knew that this was the chance that we had to make ourselves, to, to make Rice distinctive in nanoscale science and nanotechnology. We did it. We were, we, the, the, the gamble paid off handsomely. We are recognized today, not just for Rick and Bob Snowbells, which is just great, uh, but we're recognized for having had the first coherent large-scale program of faculty, staff, and student investment and facilities in nanoscience. As you can't, you can't pick up, 
you can't pick up science or nature or any of these journals now without having one or two or three articles in on nanoscale science or nanotechnology and uh, two-thirds of them have the uh, ha either mentioned Rice or mentioned Smalley or Jim Tour or others. So it, it did work well for us, and the, the people who were on the board were very proud of the fact that we made the right move. But it was risky, you know, because a lot of people were kind of sniffing, you know, <laughs> uh, nanobots and things like that. In fact, uh, there were a couple of newspaper articles that kind of made fun of us, Houston Chronicle. And uh, I never have gone back and said, hmm, told you so, but I, maybe I will, uh, will one day. So that. I was, I'm very proud of the fact that we have done something about atrocious conditions for the humanities. Uh, I have been saying, I started saying my first year that, that humanities faculty were housed in their labs and their offices, their labs being the library, you know, they had facilities comparable to what I had as a graduate student in Illinois in the period 1964 to 68. And I thought, I knew that we were losing faculty not just for that reason, but uh, we lost a wonderful young faculty member to Johns Hopkins, partly because we did not provide him with the tools of the trade and a place, to, a decent hobby top for humanities. You know who I'm talking about. And we, we knew we had to do something about that. And first, my first thought was we must do something. Uh, I, with, I, we were building Newdale Butcher Hall, and so that the old chemistry building was going to be vacant. I thought, we will just renovate that and give it to the humanities. And I spent the next two years scouring the land for money to renovate it for humanities and got no, not even a penny. Pretty soon, you know, I learned from these things. Pretty soon, I thought, well, it's not going to work. We're going to have to just build a new facility. And I remembered that we were thinking about using building the Baker Institute back uh, where the humanities building is now. So I knew the footprint would work there. It would be a nice building, and it would fit. So I said to the board, you know, we got to do a new humanities bill. I mean, we don't have any money yet, but this is overdue, and we got to get moving on it. And we'll find the money, but in the meantime, let's do get started. So we brought in a wonderful architect. We had a wonderful users committee headed by Gail Stokes to uh, make sure that the, the, of course, we wanted a beautiful building like the other Rice buildings on campus, but we wanted also to make sure that the faculty had a voice in in, in the function of the building. And that, thanks to Gail and the good architect and Dean Curry and his people, I think that worked out. And from there we moved to Razor and re completely renovated what I considered to be the, the worst classroom building I had seen in a long time for anything. Right. And uh, then, of course, when the business school moved out, we, we always had in mind that that was to go to the humanities. And some of Sewell, that renovation has affected the humanities. So, you know, we can't, we can't stop, but I think we've made huge dents in that particular problem. Um, I've very, been very proud of what we've been able to do with financial aid. And I've been very proud of what we've been able to do with study abroad. When I came, I saw a figure of 16% of our students partaking in study abroad. And I thought, in this day and age? Now, you know, I was a... I was a young man who I went to the University of Florida from junior college, okay. I had literally just fallen off the turnip truck. I had never been outside the state of Florida except in Montgomery, Alabama for a ball game, okay, to see the, go up and see the Dodgers plates. Never been. So I really was just off the turnip truck. And I was, uh, let us put it this way, I was among, I was not a very cosmopolitan person. I'm not now either. But I certainly wasn't then. But I, I came to see, after time at Harvard and Duke, I came to see how study abroad uh, really transformed people. By the way, we send more people to study abroad now than Harvard does, by their count and by our count. And I saw it at Duke, too, except at Duke it made me, it irritated me no end that everybody wanted to go to study abroad where English was spoken. And I thought, we're going to change that, too. We're going to get people to do study abroad Except we're going to get them to go to places where English is not the language of instruction. That's one reason why we invested in the Center for Study of Languages so heavily, and it's worked out. And I got to thank, I've got to thank Judith and Gail Stokes for going along with myself and two different provosts when we insisted when we recruited them both, we're going to do this. We're going to do it right. We're going to be the first research university to really do language instruction right, and I think we're on our way. Uh, 
So our, that leads me into the internationalization of the university. I would say that I haven't been here a long time. That that next to the college system, I think the single thing that has most changed and improved the undergraduate experience is the extent to which undergraduates now have meaningful experiences overseas. Yes, that has absolutely revolutionized the student body. I like to say, and it's almost true. I like to say that within two months, uh, two minutes of talking to any undergraduate. I can tell you whether they've studied abroad or not. Without, if, without having them even say they've been to study abroad, I can just tell. I can just tell from attitudes, I can tell from their intellectual posture and from so many other, hear a word or a phrase in French or Spanish or, or, or German. Now that leads me into internationalization. And that was the first thing I said the, the, when the, I talked to the search committee up in Washington and I met the search committee somewhere else and then the board sent two different delegations to see me of the of the trustees. So I had half of them come one time and I had half of them come another out of the way places in Durham because you know we want to all keep us all quiet. And to both groups, one group was led by Charles Duncan and another group was led by uh, John Cox. And the book Johnny's Plane was used both times. And I said look as uh, long as we're talking you understand that you really shouldn't be talking to me unless we're all serious about making Rice a highly internationally focused university. Yes, I'd heard about going beyond the hedges locally, and I, that means a lot to me. And outreach, as you know, means a lot to me. Uh, and we, we got to do that, and we got to be better citizens of Houston, and we got to be better citizens of Texas, and we are. We are a lot better uh, because we've gone behind, beyond the hedges. But I said one thing is I am I am. Uh, devoted to saying that universities that do not have a strong international outlook and focus are going to be irrelevant. And they all agreed. They said, well, okay, well, you figure out what you need to do. Well, one thing was, a st was the study abroad. Another was languages. Uh, another was uh, the International University of Bremen. As it happened at Duke, when I left, I had been in the middle of negotiations with the German foreign, uh, the German Defense Department and the American Defense Department, about taking over some barracks in Berlin. Now, barracks in Berlin are not like barracks at Fort Hood. These are campuses, and they are very nicely appointed. And uh, so the, the Americans moving out, I was trying to lay claim to one of the barracks in Berlin. Was I'd visited, and uh, uh, actually the discussions were pretty well advanced, and then the uh, German government decided to move the capital back to Berlin. All that was gone, okay, so just missed. But I kept, I kept my interest in trying to internationalize Duke through uh, a German and Spanish and Italian connections. But when I left, nobody took it up. But I came here, people knew that I was interested in this sort of thing. And in one year, in 95 or 96, I had a, I had first had a visit from a delegation from Baden-Württemberg, Heidelberg, okay, the, the Lander, Baden-Württemberg, and uh, they wanted us to think about a branch campus. I said, no, we, we, we don't do that. That's for big universities. No, we don't, we don't do that. And besides that, they weren't really interested in a university. They were interested in a college, in you know, a law school or a business school. No, we're that fine, but somebody else can do that. And then I was visited by a group from Cologne, a rather high, rather high. A level delegation from Cologne. We met in the founders room and they were a little more serious. They were all serious about it, but they still also, they did not have an idea of a university in mind. They really were looking, you know, let's help us start a business school, maybe a rice business. No, we don't do that. Then we had a call and you know about, you wrote the, you, you know all about this, you can fill in. And of course, so when, so when I got the call and when Ronnie called me, I was already my, the tracks were greased, you see. I knew what I thought we should do. And the, the, the question then was, uh, are, are the people from Bremen interested in something that we're interested in? And so we sent, we sent our group over there, headed by our provost, and they came back with this idea, well, uh, the, 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 the first group that came to see me about Bremen wanted us also to do a branch campus. I said, no, not a branch campus, but you got the right idea about trying to have a whole university. But we won't. We don't do branch campuses. And by the way, it should not be a branch of any university. It needs to be a German university. 
well, will you help? And I said, I don't know. Let's see if there's a confluence of interest. So we sent that, that delegation over. And you know who was in the delegation. And they came back with this idea. And because we had support from the, the industrial establishment and from the political establishment being a coalition government, the, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, and they were working fine, too. They're still doing fine with the coalition. It's a model for the rest of Germany, if you ask me. And we had support from the State University of Bremen. So, well, it looks like to me the stars are all aligned uh, correctly, and so we decided to help. But it, we wanted to make sure that it was university not modeled after Rice in every detail, but in our tradition. Private, tuition-paying, need-based, arts, science, letters, with an emphasis on teaching and research. And that's what we had when we were going to have our first graduating class on June the 2nd or 3rd, and I'm going to go. Uh, so that that has been very pleasing as a part of our internationalization effort. Uh, now, let me see. Where did I go from there? Uh, I've been very pleased with how we have been able to to uh, integrate with the rest of the local with the local community with our outreach programs. Uh, when I came, we had nobody trying to keep track, and we had wonderful people like Richard Tapia and Poking and mathematics and others. Uh, they, in science and engineering, there was tremendous in, 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 in interest in outreach. This is totally different from Duke where I couldn't get the scientists and engineers to be interested in anything except what they were doing on campus. It was the humanities and the social sciences. But here, it turns out, in math and engineering and these other, they were really interested. They were interested in, 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 in extending the Rice's reach into the minority community and into communities that were much lower income. They were interested in trying to help train teachers. Well, this is, this is revolutionary. I said, well, we got to do something about that. So I sat down one Sunday and counted our outreach programs, and at that time there were 12. And uh, they were almost all in science and engineering. I said, you know, we can do better than this. So little by little, we built that up into about 55 or 60 outreach programs, some very large and self-supporting, some very small and operating on a shoestring. But most of them make a difference, and I've been very pleased with what's happened. Those outreach programs, too, they pay off in all kinds of unexpected ways. Ronnie Wells first met Otto Potkin mm -hmm. in a teaching institute for high school teachers in math. Mm -hmm. That's the reason yeah. I can call Ronnie Wells about IUB. Yeah. So the IUB, in some sense, oh. comes out of the fact that Ronnie Wells was interested in teaching high school teachers how to teach better math. That's the wonderful thing about academia. There are all these unlabeled eggs lying around. And if you get lucky, they'll hatch, you know? If you get lucky, and we, we got lucky, and of course we help make our right. own luck, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Uh, uh, now, I count as, as, our, as our flagship in outreach, I've always counted continuing studies. And that is, as you know, the largest continuing studies program in humanities in the state. And it's very successful, and I thought that was, this was, this was the point of the spear. And that's, that's where we, we could make ourselves known in the community. I've been very pleased with what's happened. And who knows, we may be able to do even better right. pretty soon. I'm hoping. I hope so, too. Uh, so the outreach has been a source of great personal and professional satisfaction to all of us. I know in some of the things that you've written, you've also uh, talked about the improvements in the uh, infrastructure and the success of the athletic program. Yes. Upgrading the stadiums and so forth and having significantly better stadiums. If you're going to do it, you, you better be proud of it or you don't do it. That was what, that's what I told the board, too, when they interviewed me. At the time, at Duke, I wasn't sure how I felt about intercollegiate athletics because, to be quite frank, I thought basketball was a little overdone there. And so when I came here, I wasn't really sure. I said, but I do know one thing. If we're not proud of it, then we ought not to be doing it. And you can't, if, you can't, if you can't be proud of what your young men and women do on the field in the classroom, then... You, you ought not to be doing. And for, to do that, though, you've got to have some decent facilities. And we had a severe lack of that. <laughs> but most of all, we had this attitude of that uh, losing or, or not doing your best was acceptable. And I, that is totally alien to my way of thinking. And so we, we, we have worked hard on that. And I think the, you know, we've won over two dozen championships. And we've done it the right way. And other places consider us the model. All of the great critics of intercollegiate athletics at Indiana and all these other places write me wanting to know how we can do it. 
our, you know, the, the rice way here. As you know, we have a we have some people here who don't feel that way, and that's fine. We can always we talk. We are in the midst of talking about it right now. But I, 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 I did say I remember saying, if we're not proud of it, let's just don't do it. Okay, let's just don't do it. Let me slightly change the uh, focus here. Uh, you've been at Rice for 11 years, and you knew a lot about Rice before you mm -hmm. came. Of course, now you know Rice really well. What about Rice, or your experience here, has most surprised you? Have you been surprised by development, positive or negative? I haven't really been surprised. Uh, I guess I have been uh, a little amazed at how we have been able to go out and recruit young people and nurture them because I don't see that on campuses across the country. I mean, we don't, by the way, we don't do a perfect job. We, we got a long way to go. But we, we do a better job than any place I know of, that which means that we're, we're doing it about 30% of what we should be doing, okay? Um, so I've, not, I've been surprised that the young people we've been able to attract and keep, okay? Because there's, there, there's, there's all of these, uh, you know, in some fields you want to be in Boston because of the center of gravity of the disciplines there, and some you want to be in, in the Bay Area. And it's hard to keep people away from those things, you know, those centers of gravity. And, uh, and you know, we're not near any mountains, and we're not near any beautiful white beaches, and, and it gets a little warm here sometimes. So uh, the, the card climate is not one that we play often, except to point out the days like today, which are just wonderful. And I, I think we get seven and a half months of the year like that, but that's hard to sell. So I've been, I, I've been, I thought it was going to be tougher to keep some of these people than it has been. We have been engaged in terrific fights this year against raiding parties, and so far we're fending them off. And I don't want to jinx our, our luck this year, but uh, if people ask me, uh, Charles Duncan every year would say, okay, Malcolm, tell the board what's, our biggest, what's your biggest problem. And I say, our biggest problem is recruiting and retaining really great faculty. That's our biggest problem. And I say that year after year, and that's still our biggest problem. Now, we have a good problem because people want our faculty. Right. Okay. What you wouldn't want is a faculty that That's right. Want. That's right. But that is our biggest problem. Right. And I've, I've been fortunate that I've had provosts really focused on that. Sometimes the deans, I have, I, I, the only times I've really been not pleased with deans is when they don't tell me or the provost until the very last minute that someone's in danger. And I really get angry with that because everybody knows I want to know as soon as the first, as soon as the first overture is made, I want to know so we can do something about it. Now there's some, there's some that you want to go. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, I can, I can A second surprise has been the, the uh, energy of the faculty I used to say at Harvard that about one-eighth of the faculty had retired in C2 after getting tenure. And at Duke, I was pleased to learn that it was about a tenth. And here I was pleased to observe now after 11 years it's about a twentieth. I think that's very, I think it is due to our size. I think it's due to our culture. I think it's due also, we do work on civility here. You know, even, we did, I don't know if you were at a faculty meeting the other day. But, uh, you know, th this was a contentious set of issues, and with one or two exceptions, it was conducted in, in the kind of civil tone that I believe universities should try to set, that universities should try to set this example for civility in, in discourse. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons, but we don't, we, we don't get a lot of people, I, I can name almost on the fingers of one hand, uh, the faculty who have really retired in situ since I've been in here, been here. And some of them we finally got to retire de jure as well, okay? And this wasn't the case at Harvard or Duke. I could name you. I used to teach in the classes of some of these people who didn't take their teaching seriously. And, you know, they'd, they'd go leave their students for two or three weeks at a time. I'd go in and take care of them for a couple of weeks and felt like they got more than that's those two weeks and did, got the rest of the semester, and it was true. Uh, so that was a little surprising, but then I began to understand that it had to do with size and tradition. Thinking back over the last 11 years, uh, 
you and your team of administrators have had to make a leaders, uh, leaders. leaders. Because uh, people who, who do it right don't administer. They're always trying to innovate. Okay. You're, you and your cohorts have made yeah. a number of important decisions, and some of those decisions have been tough, and some you've had to really fight for, and you've had to sell those decisions to the board or to mm -hmm. the faculty or to the students or whatever. What do you think, what has been your, your and your team's toughest decision? What have been the toughest issues you've had to face? Well, we prepare so much and we work so closely with the board that by the time we get ready to bring something forward, it's not tough anymore, okay? It really isn't. I, mean, I learned this in Asia. Uh, you take things to the board once you know how it's going to turn out. You don't, you do not, this happened at Duke, they take them into the board and fight it out. That doesn't work. Don't surprise them. Uh, don't, don't surprise them, but it's more than that. You've got to involve them all along the way, okay? so. I can't say, to be honest, I can't say that anything was tough by the time we brought it up. Uh, sometimes it was tough getting it going, but we had a board that understood and we had generally a, a supportive faculty. And so, tough decisions? Uh, you, know, you make these trade-offs every day and they're tough. But in terms of putting my finger on anything, look, not even, I mean, let, let, me, let, me, let me give you some examples of what, what, that have been tough decisions elsewhere. Diversity. Uh, when I came, I made it very clear, and I make no apologies for this, I'm, uh, and I make no apologies now. Uh, I made it very clear to the board that I really believed in this and that this was going to be a change, that we were going to see a change there, and I was going to work hard for it. Not, not because of the people were that there were entitlements, but because I think you get a much more richly textured campus uh, that way. And besides that, I had, I had known of many young, in my, because of my experience, young blacks who never got the chance to show that they could do the equivalent of throw a high, hard fastball you know, in the classroom. They never got that chance. And I worked with them when I grew up, and I knew they were just as smart as I was. Okay? And in, in street smarts, they were a lot smarter. And so, for a variety of reasons, the, uh, I, I've been always very committed to this, and I remain committed to it, in, in spite of everything that we're, we're seeing now, people are backing away from it. I don't, I don't understand why. I really don't. And I have never had any trouble making this case. But I found a very receptive board, and I found a very receptive faculty. So it wasn't tough. Another one had to do with, uh, this was kind of small in the sense of, of uh, what it what it meant for the university finances, but it, may, it meant a whole lot more than just finances, and that was uh, domestic partner benefits. And in that case, we started talking about it in '95 about you know the pros and the cons. And by the time we got through talking about it, people who had opposed it because it was going to be expensive could see that that was a red herring. It was not going to be expensive, okay. And by the time I was able to show that we were ha having trouble <coughs> recruiting some good people because of that. Uh, that, uh, that when it finally came to up for board consideration, I didn't have to do a thing. Businessmen on the board stood up and says we need to do. They said we need to do this. I didn't have to say anything. Well, that, what you said there about the uh, response to the Hopwood case is one of the cases in which I thought. You and the whole team at Rice made a bold and a courageous decision. You could have imagined, you could have imagined that there were outside people who thought that, that was wrong, or we were. We were oh. I, I, there's a case in which I think that that's the kind of decision that I was talking about. Or, for example, I thought perhaps the, uh, the uh, making the case that Rice should adjust its charter so that it could borrow money, or maybe another decision that people have been here a long time know that. For a long time, there was a perception on the part of many people that Rice needed to have a major fund campaign, mm -hmm. but that sort of never yeah. happened. And so I think from, an, from a person, just on the faculty, one of the big key decisions mm -hmm. that you and your team helped push through and are just about now on the eve of completely succeeding is having the first major mm -hmm. comprehensive mm -hmm. campaign. Was that a very difficult sell? No. no. And, and neither was the, the loan. And here's my very first board meeting. I said, look. I want you to understand something, and I know you're not ready to do anything about it now, but I've got to tell you this, okay, so you won't think I'm a perfect idiot. I want to tell you what we're leaving on the table by not being able to borrow, 
Okay, and so I laid out my case. And of course, there's this word that I refused. I don't, I did not prohibit my deans and vice presidents from saying any words except one, arbitrage. I said, don't talk about it in public because it'll get us in trouble. See, I knew that I'd been working on the tax side of the budget for a long time. And I knew that the IRS and the Treasury got very upset when they saw that when, when universities crowed about arbitrage using tax exempt finance. That's what it is. I said, let me show you how much money we're leaving on the table because of, uh, we're, we're not doing debt finance. And they said, well, that's interesting, but we're not ready. But so we kept talking about it. Over the next three years, we talked about it. And by the fourth year, we were ready to do it. it and it was not at all. It was not at all controversial by the time. This is called working a decision. Okay, In a university, you can get a lot done provided you're not in a big hurry. Okay, You can keep getting a lot done. You can do any one thing you want and, and, and you know lightning fast, but you're not going to get away with it again. Okay, I learned that a long time ago. So this is called working the problem. It's the same with, with the campaigns. Well, you know, we're just... We've got, we've got these needs, and we're going to have to go ahead, and we don't have any experience. And, of course, we didn't have any plan. We did not have any fundraising infrastructure. Our director of development had refused to ask people for money on principle. Can you imagine that? <laughs> By the time we got ready, it was not controversial at all. It did, it did represent... Uh, a really major change. I mean, for so long, people, a lot of even pe people who should have known better thought, right, had enough money, mm -hmm. or it was somehow crude to yeah. ask for money. Well, I had this argument. A lot of people came in, a lot of alumni came into my office to talk about it, and I got to tell you, every one of them, when they walked out, had changed their mind. Even, even, even Mackey, who was the, you know, uh, John Mackey, now, he was the most ardently opposed, and he came in, and I, uh, talked to him and he said, well, I didn't, I didn't really see it that way. I, I won't, I'll quit bugging you about it. But the case had been made long before. But all of this stuff, John, is that you, if you, to do these things the way we've done them, you have to be in full teaching mode all the time. And if you do, then they're not any tough decisions because you, know, you, you quickly learn that some things are never going to happen. We're never going to increase enrollment 40 percent. By the way, I don't want to do it. Okay, but we don't we don't fight battles that we don't need to fight. Let me ask you a question. This might be hard to a answer. Uh, thinking back over the last eleven years or so, are there any decisions or uh, decisions made or not made that you regret? Uh, yes, I regret not following my own uh, counsel on Catri. Uh but I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to take the, 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 I'm not trying to lay that off on anybody. But as I said publicly to the press, we could have handled that a lot better. Okay, and I had actually begun another way of handling it, and I got a proposal to do it another way. And I should have listened to, I, to myself, and I didn't. Uh, we still had to make a point about k True being a university asset and the board holds the license. And it's not a plaything of a small group of people, including there, there was a the minority of Rice students involved in the program. Uh, but we could have handled that a lot better, but a lot, of was, a lot was learned in the process, too. Um, what are the regrets? I was thinking about that the other day now. Uh, I regret very much not breaking up the responsibility right away when our first director of development was uh, left. <laughs> uh, I regret, I should have, uh, I, I, I knew from my past experience that they really should be uh, a separate uh, separation between public affairs and development, and I didn't do it. And uh, that cost us some valuable momentum, but now we're doing it right. We're doing development right, and we're doing public affairs really right. And uh, I should have, uh, that's about, that was my first major search committee, and I really wasn't accustomed to using search committees. And I, I let this one, uh, I should have just ended the search uh, and started all over. I've learned that much. You know, you, you, sometimes you just have to end. 
and start all over. But uh, I, I regret that because that cost us some time and momentum. You have a lot of experience with at Harvard and Duke and at Rice, and just generally speaking, you are very well informed about American higher education. What do you see? Uh, how do you define Rice's special niche? If I could use that term, what is it that gives Rice a special? Oh, niche? well, there's several things. The first one is that I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that knows anything about higher education that Rice and Princeton do the very best job of any university in, 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 for, for undergraduates. I don't think there's a shadow of a doubt, okay? Your, my friends at Stanford will tell me that. No, Larry Summers would never try to tell me that Harvard does a better job with undergraduates, okay? They get bright students. Uh, but I don't think there's any question. And I'm, Princeton does one thing better than we do, and that's the senior thesis. And I, 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 I did try when I first came to try to make some headway on, on that, but that I learned uh, that not to fight that battle here. It wasn't time. We had enough trouble as it was trying to articulate curriculum reform, and I, re I regret that we, we didn't get that done, but we will never get it done until we change our governance structure. That I finally realized, too. That was a big disappointment, by the way, because we had the cream of the crop working on that curriculum reform, and we didn't get it. And I'm not saying every part of it was, was was desirable, but it was sure would have been an improvement. But we're not going to get it. The faculty is now talking about how it's going to reform the way it's governed and make make these decisions. And when that happens, we'll be able to get some meaningful curriculum reform. And that's a, that's that's the unfinished business that, that we must do. Uh, but uh, what, what was so talk, one part of Rice's niche is absolutely unexcelled undergraduate teaching. That's right. What, what are other aspects of Rice's special niche? The other, the other special niche is that we, we do certain kinds of graduate education just about as well as anybody. Uh, we have a problem with size. There are some economies of agglomeration in graduate uh, study, particularly in the sciences and engineering, but also in history. Uh, a place like Duke, which uses uh, history, uh, and, and, and a place like Northwestern, they use history graduate students for instruction a lot. So they can bring in all kinds. And it takes a burden off of their fellowship budget. And so they can they can pick and choose from a from a thicker pool of, of, of students, okay? And we can't do that because we don't we don't use we don't use teaching assistants that much. Uh, of course that's another thing that makes us distinctive too. Right. Uh, but I, we're just I think we're we've shown how we have mastered the art not of just of interdisciplinary collaboration, but we've mastered the technology of interinstitutional collaboration. I mean, we really have. And I think that's going to pay big dividends in the research enterprise and not just in the life sciences. And I think that's another of our, of our special claims to fame. What uh, some people uh, talk about the college system as mm -hmm. being a really special part of course, that's the Rice undergraduate program. Mm -hmm. But how, how do you value? How do you see the future of the college system in Rice? Uh, I think you know. I I happen to believe that what we do, and we, we there don't we, we don't we don't do it all well, but this whole idea of bringing you in and telling you almost at random, go live there and learn to like it and learn to live with others. I think that's a tremendous advantage for our students, and it shows when they get out. Okay, just like our honor system shows in our students when they get out. Uh, as you know, I've been, I have been saddened and sometimes disgusted with some of the uh, disrespect toward women and others in some of the college cheers and others. But we've been working on that. You can't, you can't have a decree coming down on how don't ever do this anymore. What you've got to do is to start working that problem. And we have. And we've done it little by little every year. So that things like... Uh, uh, nod while you certainly wouldn't want to take your mother. Uh, there's certainly it's certainly not nearly as what it used to be, for example. Uh, but I think that, 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 that there there's I, I would like to see more identification with the wider university. But I will take what we have in terms of the college system, and uh, and and gladly gladly uh, uh, accept the flaws. Because it is something that I think is almost unique in American education. There are other places that have residential colleges, okay, 
But until recently, you know, Harvard just went to a lottery not too long ago. But uh, that's only for three years. Okay, the first year you're in the quad. We're the only place I know of that really has a mostly random system. Okay, there there is some trying to fix if your dad went to Hanson, you know, was in Hanson, maybe we'll try to get you in Hanson. Okay, uh, but that's about as far as it goes. But we're the only one that takes it for all four years. I think I myself think that that idea that freshmen are involved in the college system is extraordinarily yeah, important. Right, so, extraordinarily yeah. important. And, and the Honor Council, I think, you know, we it, it had, it's bumpy and every year is different. And there's lots of, of misinformation about it. But I, I am convinced that cheating at Rice is far less serious than any place else I know of. And that's what my colleagues tell me, too. That's my sense, too. And, you, and it stamps, I, it, it, it puts a stamp on people. And I've had two letters since I've been here of people, one, in the, one person got his degree in the 50s and one in the 60s, writing to tell me that they were ready for me to revoke their degrees because they now admit they cheated. <laughs> and they're ready to take their medicine. And I point out that, A, it's kind of past the academic statute of limitations. Okay. Uh, I just have two more questions. One, again, thinking back over the last 11 years, if, if you could, if you had a magic wand and you could change one thing about Rice, what would that be? Oh, gee, because we so many changes have happened, right. uh, and you know, I'm 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 grateful for the the things that have happened. You know, Dag Hammarskjöld once said, uh, "For all the wonderful things that have happened to us, we say thank you, and for all the things that happen to us in the future, we say yes." Uh, can I answer that one tomorrow? Sure. Can I have a little time to right. think about it? Okay. So this will be my last question. When we started at the very beginning, Andrew just talk, talked about what was it about Rice that attracted you here. Yeah. I asked you, and you gave a series of answers to what you thought were the pressing issues facing Rice in 1993. Yeah. Well, here it is, 2004, and these are these are issues that you will not be addressing specifically, mm -hmm. but your successor will. But looking back over the last 11 years. What do you see now as the kind of issues pressing rise as we move into the 21st century? What are the most pressing issues for the future for this small, special kind of place? Well, we're, we're immune from some of the worst problems of American society. At least we're temporarily immune. Uh, I worry very much about the products of our K-12 public education system. But Rice, there'll always be enough really good people coming out to fill up Princeton's and, and Rice's and, and, uh, and uh, Stanford's. So that's not going to affect us that much. It just saddens me that we may be creating uh, uh, two very distinct, really distinct tiers of society. One that would be comparable to serfs and the other people would live like pharaohs because the, the serfs will not be trained to do anything. So that's a concern of mine about this country, but it's not a concern of mine about rice. Uh, I worry about accessibility, but we still do a better job on accessibility, financial accessibility, than anybody else. Uh, I really would like to see our low-income uh, uh, need-based scholarships beefed up, but everybody's attentive to that. This is not a neglected problem. Everybody's always fighting to do that. We just always need more. But I wouldn't say that you know this is not a crisis for us, but it's just something that we we, we we're all focused on. Uh, challenges other than that. Well, of course we have the more mundane challenges. We need a, we need another college so we can house about eighty five percent of our students on campus. We need a rec center because uh, we don't want our youth to fall pray to the, the, the excessive obesity that is besetting our nation and, and now the rest of, the, uh, the, rest of the, the, the wealthy world, including Britain. What about the, uh, I mean, the kind of common perception is that Rice is uh, as good an undergraduate institution as any in the United States or maybe in the world. Our graduate program, although there are pockets of mm -hmm. greatness, that our graduate program in total it's not, it's not up to the standard of our undergraduate program. And certain people, a lot of people, 
I'm one of those who argue that in some sense it's extremely important in the next decade or several decades that Rice in some sense in no way lessen the undergraduate quality but improve the graduate. Is that a problem? or would No. You see, this is another one of those things that people told me was going to be difficult. And I, I started talking about strengthening graduate programs when I first came here. And by the time we got ready to start putting more serious money in, the board was behind it. Okay? And we have. Well, we've done quite a bit. But we, we could, our history was such that we, we had underinvested greatly, particularly in stipends, but also in the tools of the trade. And it takes time, and it takes time to change perceptions. I would say that, there, that bioengineering uh, and computers and, and the computational sciences at Rice uh, produce, uh, uh, have the, the, the research that is, that is produced there will stand up to just about any place except perhaps not in specialized fields, robotics, Carnegie Mellon is clearly superior there. You know, uh, you can pick out subfields, but I, I think you can. I think in in the in the humanities, uh, history and and English come to mind. Certainly, the history department, person for person, is just as good as the one at Duke, which is much more highly ranked. But one reason is, of course, they get more graduate students because they can they hire they have them they have the graduate students teaching, and so they've got a better menu to select. Some in chemistry at Duke. Uh, just about every every graduate student recruited at Duke has to teach chemistry and teach the labs. We, we don't really use them for that very much here. So we don't get the number to select from. So I, I have, you know, I, it was, I wanted to make it clear to the board that I viewed Rice as a research university. Now, I've never given a speech that I didn't talk about Rice as a research university and how we all should be grateful for Norman Hackerman for bringing us into the AAU at a time when we may not have deserved it. <laughs> but such was Norman's reputation that uh, it, 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 it happened, and it, it, it's, a, it's a thing that feeds back on itself. So yes, there's much to be done. We have to remember that we do have problems of coping with, with the problems of small size, but I would rather cope with those than cope with the problems of great size. I am on the Commission of 125, which is to help determine the future of the University of Texas at Austin. As you know, I do a lot of work on public education because I believe in it. Uh, I also believe in what we do, too. That's competition between publics and privates is what made the higher education sector so great in this country. But they both need to be strong. But in Texas, you know, you got 49,000 people, and we all know, I've been on the research committee, uh, looking at how, how UT is going to be distinctive in research over time. Uh, you're, you've got average class size in the sciences of 45 people there. Hmm? <coughs> you've got all you've got maybe 130 different kinds of institutes that have kind of grown up like Topsy, <coughs> and it's a well-led place. And there's a lot of really good people there. But how, what can you do with 49,000 students on campus? Arizona State yes, this week proudly announced that they're going to expand their campus to 85,000 in their efforts to become a distinctive research university. Well, I got news for them. That's not the way to do it. <coughs> so we have, we'll have the problems of small size, but I, I won't, I'd rather deal with those. What we've got to do is to work, get up our endowment now. We, we, we need a second campaign pretty soon, and it really got to be focused on that. We need another, we need another two and a half billion before 2010, focused uh, on graduate programs. Now, we've done I'm, I'm proud of what we've all done in undergraduate education. Look at, and the proof is in the pudding, look at where our students are placed. Look at where they go for graduate school, professional school, medical school. Look what happens to them in the job market. That's of all the proof you need. And we, we've done it, and they come out with less debt than anybody except Brigham Young as a private university, and of course that's a church school. So uh, I think that that has to be the next campaign. But it's, it's a manageable problem. But we won't be able to be, uh, we, it, it'll be uneven. It'll have to be uneven. But the, the university has been very mature about this. Uh, we, have, we have good programs that don't have PhD programs. We have good departments that don't have PhD programs. Now, per, uh, sociology probably should have one. But we have others that don't. And I think the burden of proof is on those who show why we might need that. I'm, I'd be willing to listen. Yes, that's, that's the big challenge, but it, it's a manageable problem because we don't have anything to apologize to our alumni or to our donors or anybody else about the undergraduate. We can, 
we can focus now on the graduate program without n knowing that that flank is, that the undergraduate flank is fully covered. And that's an enviable position to be in. Right. Well, our time is ending. The next time I'd like to ask you about the professional schools here and like to ask you about the, uh, the prospects and the opportunity, the challenges, maybe even the problems of a greater involvement with the medical center. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, because it's obvious, yeah. here we are in the middle of a city with not only medical institutions, but all kinds of artistic and cultural institutions. Yeah. And we're small, and we can only benefit by reaching out and cooperating. So I'd yeah. like to talk to you. I know well, you're good. very interested in that. And let's talk about what professional schools we, we, I hope we will never have. Right. I hope we will never have a law school. I have nothing against law, but there's plenty of places right. that do it well, and right. we don't need to do one right. Uh, we, I hope never to see a school of education here. I think that's a large part of what's wrong with American higher education. What about medical school? Hmm? What about a medical school? Uh, we have two, right. and we don't pay for either one of them. That's, that's my sense. Hmm? <laughs> why, the best, why should we want we're, one? We're the best possible oh, world. We can have all the benefits. They're, they're the right cost. across the street, right. and they respect us, and yes. they want us to help broker things. Yes. They want us to help. Right. We are leading. We are leading so many things. That, uh, remind me to talk about Texas UK. The program right. remind me to talk about these the consortia and the various things that we're involved in. We're we're leading those things, right. great. Because we're trusted. Good, good. Well, this is an excellent start, and we'll do this one more hour tomorrow. All Thanks right. so much. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, this is again. This is John Bowles interviewing Malcolm Gillis on uh, Wednesday, April 14, 2004. Uh, I'd like to pick up on some of the things we were talking about yesterday and move on to s somewhat different uh, topics. So here, I want to start with a question that's very broad uh, and deals with the School of Architecture, the Shepherd School of Music, yes. and the Jones Business School. And that is, I'd like for you to hear you, you talk about your sense of the role of, the importance yeah. of, the significance of, the future of these three professional schools yeah. at Rice. Well, to be a university, you, uh, you, it's unimaginable you'd have a university without some professional schools. Uh, other schools have law schools and divinity schools. Uh, I think that's great for them, but it's not, not a felt need at Rice. I do believe that the three that we have have been selected very carefully, and I believe that they contribute immensely to the fabric of the university and to the, to the, to the intellectual uh, uh, the intellectual mixture of the university, beginning with architecture. This is a very small school of architecture, but really is pound for pound, as we say a lot at Rice, but it's really true. Pound for pound is probably the best there is in terms of impact per faculty member, impact per student. You may or may not know of the terrific competition for students to get in. You know that, that the we probably have about 25 to 30 apply every year for every position we have available at the undergraduate level. So it's immensely selective. I happen to be on the board of a technology and design firm in Los Angeles. It's a pretty good size, about 18,000 employees. And we do a lot of design, and it's famous for its architecture. One of the firms is called Dimgen. We, we hold 18 firms. And of course, Rice School of Architecture is known and well loved as far away as Los Angeles because of, because of what they do. But I find this to be the case all over the country. I knew something of the Harvard School of Design, and it was not an exciting place at all, okay? Uh, certainly compared to the rest of Harvard. This one fits Rice like a glove, and I think we're, we should be very grateful for William Ward Watkin for sticking around after he designed the, the, the layout and founded the School of Architecture. I think that the dean, Lars Lerup, has done an excellent job, uh, and the, 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 the students will tell you that they would be nowhere else on earth they'd rather be. Moving to music, you know, how can you speak of music without first talking about Michael Hammond? Michael was one of these one in a hundred million. Uh, not only a, a gifted musician, but uh, a, a, a very deep intellectual person with very strong convictions, not all of which were resonated with my own convictions, but I enjoyed nothing better than to cross swords with Michael because of that tremendous intellectual honesty and integrity and rigor with which he thought. 
Michael had his own way of building the Shepherd School, and build it he did. And my colleagues who are presidents who have music schools tell me that, that uh, they, they, they covet uh, what has been done. And of course, there are much bigger ones, uh, but this one may be the best one in a university, uh, in a research university in the country. And that's been due to the support of the board. Because, you know, you, you were here when the Shepherd School, when the decision was made to go ahead with the building, and there was some grousing going on among the faculty and because they thought this might take away resources from other purposes. But after now, after, the, after 15 years, Michael came about 15 years ago. Oh, no, no, no. Michael came about 19 years ago. Yeah, be about 19. Uh, now that he's gone, it's hard to not think of him being here. Uh, but after 19 years, people really understand the role of the Shepherd School at Rice, and I am very, very proud of it. Uh, the business school, the latest of our professional schools to, uh, to begin to achieve eminence. As you know, it had a rocky start, and it was not a priority of anyone uh, before 1993. And to be quite frank, and I've been up front about this, to be quite frank, when I came, I wondered whether we should keep doing it. Because it's the same thing with athletics. If we're not really proud of it, we shouldn't be doing it. If we're not really prepared to support it, we should not do it. Uh, we had an unfortunate delay when I came because of the health of the people involved, and we couldn't begin to move as fast as I thought we should have. But we did talk very seriously at the board level about either we're going to have a business school that meets right standards or we're not going to have one at all. We talked about this for over three or four board meetings, never, never with any indecision. We just wanted to, once again, we were working the problem, just like Rice does and the board does and the way I do it. We are working the problem. In the end, we said we knew what needed to be done and we knew how much resources were going to be required to do it and we've set out to do it and we have. And the business school is very highly regarded. You can't pay any attention to magazine rankings. What you have to do is to look at the employers who come here. You talk to the students, and you will find the most enthusiastic students, certainly more enthusiastic than the ones that I've known at my two previous universities about their education. Uh, and they have substantially better national magazine reputations than does the Jones School. Uh, that we have expanded the faculty, we have improved the student body, and of course we have a really state-of-the-art facility, and that was a big problem before. Uh, we've, had, we've had very good support. The building is almost paid for now. The whole program is almost paid for, and uh, I think we're in very, very good shape. A business school is very important to other departments and schools in the university, most obviously for an economics department. It's very hard to think of a really good economics department anywhere that does not also have a business school with complementary talents that can interact. Uh, it is also very often important for psychology departments, particularly when they're talking about the marketing side. But at, in the Rice context, it's very important on the science and engineering side, very much so. And we have developed linkages with the business school and engineering and science, particularly through the Rice Alliance, which uh, Steve Corral came to me a few years ago and uh, showed me the price tag to get it started, and I thought it was worthwhile, and we have managed to get other support. And uh, this, is, this is so that, that rice-related uh, uh, inventors and entrepreneurs can find a way to get their discoveries out into the world where it can do some good. And it's been very successful. We've got a lot of people mimicking it. We've been extended the, the, the net of the Rice Alliance to the Texas Medical Center and several other places. But there's more, the interaction is much more than that. The interaction with the business school with architecture, you may or may not know that, that uh, the Heinz interests have funded a professorship in design and in business. And we're going to be bringing people here. First, we're going to be bringing people with design backgrounds to make sure they get a good business background. But then, Eventually, we're going to be bringing business people here who have design interests. So the business school, when, when, when I came, I was appalled at the extent to which the business school was isolated. And I had seen that before at another university. And I said, this will not happen here. 
I'm very pleased to see how it is integrated not only with the rest of the university, but with the Texas Medical Center and fellow schools around the region and the country. That's the story, my story of the professional schools. You got any more questions about it? Well, I, I, I certainly agree. Uh, I actually like to the business school hire a person who was a historian of business. And I think, again, that would be a really good link between the humanities department and the business school. Yeah, right now I'm the closest one. Yes. And that's a far piece. But you haven't been, you, you've had other things to do the last yeah. few years. But when I was a student here in the early 60s, the Shepherd School of Music consisted of one part-time person who did choral instruction in the basement of Hammond Hall. So from the memory of yeah. a part-time instructor to an incredible music school. And I think what is really exciting, if you're a m member of the Rice faculty or an alum, is that so often there's this false image of Rice. It's still largely That's a right. technical institute. Mm -hmm. And to be able That's to right. say, look, the School of Architecture and the School of Music are probably mm -hmm. the two highest ranking things right. we have at Rice. That says a lot about how the university has right. really become a university. That's right. And if there's any alumni who ever watch this tape, I want you to know just how much in demand our graduates of the Shepherd School are, both the undergraduate and the graduate level. It's not easy to find really good positions in music these days. Our graduates do better than anyone I've ever heard of. And of course, we've had some who in a very short time have made their mark. Anna Christie is starring right now in the Mikado in New York, and she's just signed on for another major role when she finishes the Mikado. She was a freshman when I came uh, my first year. And so I have a special, I've watched her, followed her career with great interest uh, for that reason and for others. Can you imagine, I think you probably already answered this, can you imagine in the future that Rice will develop any other professional schools? You said no law school, no school of theology, and yesterday... And no education you, school. No education school, and you indicated yesterday we didn't need a medical school because we're across the street from two. That's right. So there, there are no other... I don't uh, let's know see, I, what else could we, would I there be? Know, I, it seems to me we may, we may have all we ever need. I think we do. I really think we do. I think we are, are a mature university now, and we ought to spend the next 20 years. Uh, we, we, we've added the Shepherd School, and we've, we have finally begun to invest in architecture, and we've added the business school. And now I think we could spend the next 20 years making sure they all reach their potential. Great. I'd be very surprised if any future board or president thought we needed another professional school. Let me ask you about another series of, uh, of uh, institutes or, or institutions that have developed at Rice over the last two or three decades, which I actually really very important at Rice, and that's the whole series of interdisciplinary institutes. I, I don't mean, I mean, people, I think everyone knows about the Rice Quantum Institute and so forth, but could you talk in general about how you see the role of these institutes at Rice? Oh. Then I want to ask you about two new ones, the Shell Center for Sustainability, and the new one, the Center for the Study of Advancement of Religion and Toleration, Religious Toleration. Yeah. Well, those, those two, two I've had, of course, those are two brand a new direct ones. Yes. hand. So I'd like to hear you talk real. about the institutes in general yeah. and those yeah. two in the end. Well, I think that this is very important. Uh, unfortunately, universities can easily become ossified. That is, you create an entity and in response to a certain need, and the need goes away, but the entity doesn't. I think you see that at UT Austin. That's a big problem there. Uh, needs arose and entities was created, but now there's 140 of them. That's too much, and Larry Faulkner's trying to do something about that, but it's not easy. It's not easy to, to, to dissolve something that's already been created. And that's what happens when you create a new department of something. Okay, but if you do a center or an institute in response to a problem, Rice Quantum Institute was formed when when, when people here began to understand that in quantum mechanics there were really, really uh, fruitful areas to, to explore right now, right now, that questions are, the answers for which are going begging, so let's go try to answer them. And what happened? One of the questions that was answered was the, was the, the search for that other form of carbon, carbon-60, and it was found here on campus to the everlasting credit of Rick Small uh, uh, Rick, uh, Rick, Sm uh, uh, Rick Smalley and Bob Curl and Rice University because we nurtured them from the very beginning. Of course, Bob Curl was an undergraduate here, but Rick spent his entire prof professorial career here. The Chicago claims him. They got him up on a wall of their Nobel laureates because he was a visitor one summer there. We don't do that sort of stuff. Okay, they do. 
but it, 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 then other problems in quantum mechanics came up, and the field begun to encompass just about everything in science. So the Rice Quantum Institute began to shrink, as it should, and we've moved on into other. It's it spawned uh, other institutes that re, that the, in nanotechnology and in related areas, and it's beautiful. So we're we're we don't have funds tied up now, big funds tied up in the Rice Quantum Institute. It's being slowly phased out. Instead, we have taken those and added to in these other institutes and centers that were were made possible by what happened at the Rice Quantum Institute. So as the field evolved, Rice institutionally evolved to match that. That's right. That's right. And we've done it over and over again. I think the Center for Study of Cultures. Now there's one there, that there's a need that won't go away soon. Okay. But it'll have to be nimble. If it ever settles on one particular area in the humanities and social sciences, it'll be dead quickly. It, it, the, the, what, what makes these things work is they're constantly changing. And that's what universities, that the one thing that universities are not very good at is to change. To change along with, with pro changing problems. Rice, I'm proud to say, for a long, long time, long before I came here, has been more predisposed to change than other inst in institutions in my experience. And others that I, not in my experience, but which I've been reading about for 40 years. So this, is, this has been one of the great secrets of Rice. There are other centers too. Uh, the, the, the two most recent ones are perfect examples. The Center for Sustainability, we've been fin we financed with two major gifts, one from Shell Foundation and another from, 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 from uh, George Mitchell, about five and a half million dollars. And that is to focus on problems of sustainability in society, of use of resources, sustainability in terms of getting clean air and clean water. And when I went searching for finance, my view was, don't give me an endowment. Give me some money to attack problems that are important now. Because the problems that we're talking about in terms of resource use, in terms of the oceans, in terms of potable water, in terms of clean air and clean water, if we haven't made a lot of progress at solving those in the next 10 to 15 years, forget about it. Okay? So it's set, the Center for Sustainability has a folding endowment. We're going to consume it all by about 2012, unless of course, unless of course there are new, new needs identified, in which case we'll have to go out and raise more money for it. The Center for the Study of Religious Tolerance will, is, will have an endowment. We're not counting, and it's going to be $5 million, uh, but we're not counting on that to sustain the center over the years. We're count that's just to get us going. We believe that there are enough people in the world who are interested in the lessons of history, the lessons of history that can help people understand why religious tolerance uh, is present or absent and what can be done about it. We believe that there will be ample support, and we're finding this out. We're finding now that people are coming forward saying, how can I help? So we didn't look for an endowment to keep the Boniac Center for the Study of Religious Tolerance going for the next 50 years. We only look for money to keep it going in the next eight or nine years while we proved it out. And we will prove it out. I'm convinced that this is something that will resonate with people all over the world. We have, we have Jewish money now. We're going to get Christian money. I'm going to see a man in Berlin about Muslim money and by Hindu money and whatever else. I think it should be broad-based. Will that Center for Religious Tolerance, will that be a center that primarily is a center that does scholarship and study, or will it be a center that actually takes programs out and tries to increase understanding of increased tolerance? Let me, let, me tell you, let, me, let me tell you what I told Carol Quillen, who's to be the new director, and the dean, and Bill Martin. Uh, in, in, in talking with the wonderful man who's the donor, Milt Boniak, uh, he said, look, I, there's something I want done, and there's things you want to do on scholarship. You help me, and I'll help you. And I said, let's hear it. He said, I am interested in eventually having a, a code of religious tolerance based on the lessons of history that we can talk to governments about and others and even religions uh, to, uh, and say, look, here are the lessons from the Ottomans. Here are the lessons from the Crusades. And, of course, those are negative lessons. <laughs> Here are the lessons from North and South Yemen, and let's see if their reasonable people can't begin to understand these lessons. And I said, well, the, the, we're, we're certainly not averse to this. We have, we have the Baker Institute for Public Policy, which focuses on policy and focuses on trying to make the world a better place quite apart from scholarship. 
But I said, basically, though, what we do has to be grounded in scholarship. And it has to be grounded in disciplines, not one discipline, but several. And so my view is that if, we, if a code develops out of our scholarship, this is a wonderful thing, and we will do it. And so he and I understand that that's what's going to happen. We're going to have conferences, and if governments are interested, we may go like we may evolve in the direction of the Carter Center at Emory. We don't know that. Uh, I don't know that the next president will want to be involved in things like that, or the board. I know that the board says, let's see. The board says it could do that, and if we think it's right to do, we will do. That's, that's the kind of place where we haven't tried to set anything into stone. We've tried to make it so that it could evolve and, 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 and adjust. So we will see. I hope I live long enough to see us talking to governments and institutions that I'm going to be the unpaid executive director, which means, basically, I'm going to be going scouting around for money, okay, while Carol and the others do the really tough work. You, you mentioned uh, the Baker Institute. The Baker Institute uh, is, is similar to but different from our other institutes. Could you yes. say something about the, how that was founded yes. and uh, what, what its purpose is? And, what you see as a future role of yeah. the institute? Actually, when you asked me why I des decided to come here, I, f I left that one out because I was, uh, uh, the, the others were uppermost in my mind at the time. But uh, I had seen public policy at Harvard in the Kennedy School. And I had seen a public policy institute at Duke with the Terry Sanford Institute. And I have very definite ideas about what the, the, should be, the lessons that should be taken from both of those experiences. And both of those have been pretty good experiences. They could have been a lot better, I can tell you that. One of the lessons that I drew from, from those two experiences is that, and this was not decided when I came, that a, a, a public policy institute, it's better when you don't offer degrees, okay? Public policy is not a discipline, okay? It is, a, it is, it is, it is something that emerges from having many disciplines interact and focusing on problems that are important to society, the economy and to, 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 to social problems and, and that sort of thing. But, uh, so I was insistent when I came, no degrees, no degrees. Well, nobody else had any experience with public policy institutes, so they thought I knew what I was talking about. And in this case, I did. And it was a wonderful thing not to have degrees. And I don't think we should ever think of having a degree. That we can have majors in public policy. We can create a major anytime we want in any field. We can in history, we can create a major in world history if we want to, okay? But that's not a big deal. You guys can decide that in the history department as long as your team agrees. You don't even need the approval of the president or the board. Well, you may need, the board may need to say, yes, you can do this. But they're not going to ever try to interject themselves in an, into an academic decision. Uh, so the I, I, I pushed very hard for it. I pushed very hard for it to be nonpartisan. I pushed very hard for it, along with others, to make sure that we included that the, 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 that the, the original purview of the Baker Institute was broad enough to include uh, the, the issues in biomedicine and issues in science and engineering, and that it should be international. It should have an international focus, but that focus should not be exclusive. It also should have a domestic focus. And so uh, we had two problems. We had to find a place for a home for it. And so we went out and raised the money for that. And then we had to find a director and we went out and found uh, Edge Origin for that. And these things are never easy because faculty usually are a little bit suspicious of new initiatives. You know, what does this really mean? Whose agenda is this? And you know, is this gonna be partisan or not? This is what I kept hearing over and over again. I said, no, I guarantee you as long as I'm here, it'll never be partisan. But I know that Mr. Baker, Secretary Baker, doesn't want it to be partisan either. He knows what will happen. And certainly the board doesn't. We're going to make sure it's not partisan. Uh, I think that it has proven to be that way. Uh, we've had the, the benefits to the campus in terms of bringing in people who are, who are world figures, who have interesting things to say. I'm not interested in bringing in decorations who are world figures to say, look at who we've got. Now, there, there are other, plenty of other places who do that. When we bring in people, they have something to say. The, the King of Jordan had some interesting things to say. The President of, the Prime Minister of Mongolia, he and his wife both had interesting things to say. Today, we have Hosni Mubarak coming to campus at a time of very great conflict. The President of Egypt. Yeah, a very, uh, the President of Egypt at a time of very great conflict in his part of the world, a conflict in which we are about as deeply as embroiled as we can be. This will not be a 
a photo opportunity. This will be a substantive visit. I'm very happy to say that none of these people that, that we have brought in, Nelson Mandela, Alexander Putin, Gorbachev, Kissinger, none of these have been mere photo ops. They have all been substantive. I know also in the last year or so there's been a much greater involvement of undergraduates, certain, certain uh, various guests. Yes. And, uh, uh, ambassadors and so forth have come here and had special breakfast and special oh. meetings and special panel discussions with the undergraduates. Actually, people don't know. We, we're, sometimes we're not very good at saying what we've been doing, but we've been going for a long time doing this. Uh, for example, when Valerie Giscard d'Estaing came in, of course he came at my invitation because I had known him uh, from the work that he and Helmut Schmidt did on the Euro, because I had Schmidt here. But we had, we had Giscard d'Estaing and others, we always Unless, unless they were heads of state with Putin, you couldn't do this because of the Secret Service. And their own and ours. <laughs> but with the others, particularly the retired heads of state, we always arrange sessions with the undergraduates. I'll never forget when, when, when uh, Prime Minister, when President Valerie Giscard Stang's people came for him, he said, let's go, time to go. The plane said, get out of here, I'm talking to these students. So he stayed another 30 minutes. And then I had to take him back on the bus <laughs> where his people were waiting. Uh, so it's been going on a long time, but we've decided to be a little bit more visible about it. I know I've heard some undergraduates talk about uh, wanting to develop, uh, this is in some sense in relation to the Baker Institute, wanting to develop within the political science department a major or a department of international relations. Is that a possibility? Is that, is that a kind of a, a major in international relations is something that, that the political science department can do without asking anybody. Well, they've got the provost and the dean. Right. Uh, if you want to talk about a department, that's a more serious issue. Because when you talk about a department, then you're talking about one of these things that once created is going to yeah, be around. I'm not sure if students know exactly what yeah. they want. I've heard them talk about wishing there was a major in international relations. I realize within the political mm -hmm. science department, yeah. you can certainly put together a lot of yeah. international relations courses. I, I don't see, there's nothing stopping them mm -hmm. on the major. The department, we would, that would have to pass very serious questions. Uh, we've been talking primarily about interdisciplinary activities essentially centered on the Rice campus, even though reaching out to mm -hmm. the medical center and so forth. Also, in the last few years, uh, Rice has become, as part of your original goal, yeah. as you said, if it didn't become uh, international, it become your own. You mentioned yesterday the Rice's role in the creation of International mm -hmm. University of Bremen. Yeah. But several other important things had in the last few years. One is this Texas UK collaboration yes. in nanobio, nanoscience, or whatever. Nanobio. Nanobio. And then also this uh, emerging, strengthening relationship with Monterey Tech. Could you say something oh, about yeah. those two? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the Texas UK thing uh, is something that I'm very, very close to because it came from a seminar I gave at the Royal Academy in Edinburgh. And on my way back, I stopped to see the Minister of Technology. Lord Sainsbury, and he knew about Rice. He was the, the most, the, I've, ta I've spent in my 40 years of being an economist working on problems around the world, I've talked to 100, 150 ministers of government, okay? This was the best prepared one I ever met, okay? When I walked in the door, he knew all about Rice, he knew all about me, he knew about what we did well. And he said, let's talk about collaboration. I said, let's talk about it. Uh, when I left, he said, look, if we can put together collaboration, because he knew that I was visiting Imperial College and Cambridge, and now Cambridge, is, the vice chancellor, is a dear friend of mine, uh, Allison, uh, who is, was the provost at, uh, at uh, uh, Yale, and my daughter's mentor, oh. uh, my PhD, her PhD mentor in, in primatology. So he knew I was, he said, see what, you, if you can pull together scholars at Imperial and Cambridge and later Edinburgh and, and others, University College, with Rice. And I said, well, actually Rice is pretty small, but we do have this Texas Medical Center and there's a lot going on and we have a lot going on. And in fact, we have very good uh, professional relationships with, with, uh, with UT Austin and Texas A&M and University of Houston and, and University of Texas Medical Branch, and so, and also up in southwestern in Dallas. I said, why don't we put together a Texas-UK consortium? I wish I had the pen that was designed for the consortium. I, I meant to bring it. Uh, I'll show it to you someday. It's got, it's got a big old Texas Lone Star, and then, of course, the, 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 the British Imperial flag 
on it. He said, I'll, I'll find seven and a half million dollars. Think you can find it? And I said, well, I don't think so. Between all the different institutions, that's, that's to get people together. That's not to fund research, but that's to get people together. We have had now, uh, I don't know, we've had six or seven meetings here in Texas, mostly at Rice and, and over at the medical center. Uh, and six or seven over right now. There's one. There was one just finished over in in in, in London of our biomedical and nanotechnology people and theirs. And of course, the when I came back and talked to my friends at the Texas Medical Center, they leaped at the possibility because Britain has been very sensible and realistic about stem cell research, and we are not yet. Okay, we we are not. There's too much politics tied up in it. They're, 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 they're the, the, the rest of Europe is, is, is worse than we are, but uh, in many ways on stem cell research. But so uh, the people in the medical center saw this is excellent. We have, we have access to more lines stem cell research. This is wonderful. They wanted access to not only what we were doing in nano and bio, but also to our people in information science and environmental science and others. So it's a beautiful marriage. And we charge each institution 30K a year, and we have 11 contributing. We've got some money from Houston Endowment. It's self-sustaining now. Uh, we don't raise the resources for the research. They, they, we get the faculty together, the faculties, the researchers together, and they find the money, which is what, what will happen when you get good people together. We don't try to tell them where to go. We just organize these, these, these thematic conferences thinking that we'll strike sparks, and it has, the sparks have been struck. And I'm very pleased. It may, this may go on for another four or five years, maybe, maybe another eight or nine years, but it won't go on forever because it'll evolve into something else. But in the meantime, Rice's profile gets, gets raised quite a bit. And I was very pleased Nature Magazine compared what we're doing with science in Britain with what another institution in Cambridge is doing. And said the Rice one, the, the Rice one, they, they just should have, said, should have said Texas, said the Rice one is the way to go because we don't make a big deal of it. So we're just trying to get the job done. Good. Good. Now you ask about uh, Monterey Tech. Monterey Tech, yes. Well, as you may or may not know, public education in Mexico is in horrible shape. How bad is it? Okay, Una Universidad Nacional de Mexico in in, in Mexico City has a what two hundred thousand students. In some fields, not in all fields, but in some fields, particularly in the social sciences and in business. Mm -hmm. Not so much in the humanities. Newspaper advertising in Mexico City will advertise a position that says under UNAM graduates need not apply. Okay. Now Monterey Tech de Monterey is private. It charges tuition. I think it's about eighty-eight hundred bucks now. They have some. You can get a scholarship too. And it has thirty-two different campuses. Now not all of them are real campuses. Some of them are online spots. They really have mastered the art and science of getting stuff out online. They even have little campuses and little villages up in the mountains. And you see all these campesinos standing around the TV set who are, who are learning how you, 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 you guard against potato rot and things like this, okay? And th these are very uh, innovative people. Monterey, of course, is a beautiful spot. It's, uh, I, I say to our friends there that somos todos llaneros. We're all plainsmen. They're on the same coastal plain we are. The only difference is that they're backed up right to some beautiful mountains, <laughs> and we're not. <laughs> but they are plainsmen, and they are they're inventive and resourceful, and what they've been able to do with so little is amazing. I thought so much of them that I tr have hooked them up with our IUB in, in, in Germany uh, because IUB in continuing education wants to do a lot of distance education, and so this is a natural marriage. And so isn't it wonderful? That, that people in northern Germany can learn from what's happening in, in Monterey, Mexico. How, how large is the main campus in Monterey? I mean, the central campus. Is well, it's the size so of Rice or much bigger? Or? Uh, well, actually, you know, it's, uh, it's smaller. But you understand, the University of Arizona has got uh, 30,000 students on a space half the size of Rice. So everything in Monterey is packed into uh, a little bit of space here. Uh, and they, have, they do have some really branch, true branch campuses, but the 30, they're, what they're proud of is talking about there's 32 installations across the country. And people flock to go there. That's the best, it, I think that Monterey, of course Monterey Tech focuses very much on the technical side, okay? I don't really, can't really tell you much about economics and history there. 
but it's certainly one of the best institutions in Latin America. The, 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 all around the best one I know of is Universidad Católica in Santiago. I'm on the, their fundraising board. And that was their first donor, by the way. Uh, but it is very interesting. If Houston is in, was in, within an easy day's drive to an inter a city yeah. in another country, yeah. more than two million people. I mean, it's a perfect sort of relationship oh, yeah. to us to internationalize Absolutely. our programs. And now we've got stuff going with the business school and others, and it's on an equal basis. Now this, by the way, is the kind of thing I like to do, okay? I, I used to say, my grandmother used to say that I had Kali in me, okay? You know what she meant by that? Have you ever walked across a field, two people 15 feet apart with a Kali? You know what will happen? The Kali goes crazy because he wants to herd you together, okay? He wants to get people together. My grandmother used to say I was part Kali. And actually, you know, I, I, if, 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 that's, that's probably true. I, I, I think I am part Kali, getting people together. That's very good. Uh, I grew up with hound dogs, not with Kali, so I did. Uh, I know you, this comes out of what you were saying earlier about uh, there are many collaborative relationships with the medical yeah. center. And Rice has obviously been across the medical center since it uh, began in the yeah. 1940s. We now have, once again, become an actual member mm -hmm. of the medical center. Could you say more about how that happened and what you think that means for Rice's future? Oh, well, we've been talking about As you know, we were a, a member. Right. And for some reason, I haven't been able to find it in any of the archives. Or I've talked to Norman Hackerman, and it was before his time, but somehow it just lapsed. Nothing happened. Okay, Rice became, ins a little, uh, became insular in some period and just lapsed. Uh, Apart from the, the, the wonderful work that was done with Michael DeBakey and some of our people in engineering on the artificial heart, there was absolutely no collaboration at all. Of course, that was major collaboration. Michael will tell you right now that it's one of the highlights of his career. He has a very, very strong feeling about it. You know, he's 95 now. 95. He came to our Friends of Funder thing the other night. Very unusual. Uh, it's going to mean a lot. It gets us in, we have a seat even though we're, we're small. We have a seat on the councils in the medical center, an equal seat, and it's very important for us to know what the plans are over there and for them to know what our plans are over here. Uh, we, for a long time, the head of MD Anderson, the head of Baylor College of Medicine, and the head of UT Health Science Center uh, have said, you know, you really need to be a part of us. I, I know, but we've got to work the problem. we got to work the problem. We've got to make sure that we're not entering to any new liabilities that uh, the, the board doesn't know about. And we were finally satisfied that, that not only we were not, not be airing in new liabilities, that there's some substantial savings on the bus fleet, on electricity, on, 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 the, on the library, as a, the wired library as we develop it, and many other things. So uh, I, w I, would, I would be surprised if this, if, this, uh, if this new union with the medical center doesn't result in several million dollars of savings each year down the road four or five years from now. But more than that, it's the collaboration and it's being interconnected and knowing what issues are. And we've helped them. We are in a position to know some things a little better than they are. And they're in a better, so we, they have their comparative advantage. And already, I've been to four CEO meetings and already we have been able to help them and they've been able to help us in many ways. I come back and I'll call Curry, go, go see about this, go see about that. So I, I think it's a, it's a natural for us Perhaps we weren't ready for it to, uh, a decade ago, but we're sure ready for it now. Well, how does this fit into the proposed plans to build a major research tower of some sort at the corner of the University of Maine? It's, it's very interesting you ask that, because just this morning I received a letter from Methodist Hospital. You know that we've been t uh, asking for 100,000 square feet of space in the new facility at University of Maine. And it's going to happen. Okay, make no mistake about it. It's going to happen. Uh, and as you may or may not know, there has been a, a series of disputes <laughs> between Baylor and Methodist right. over the last year. Those are getting resolved now. We've tried to help. We've tried to help resolve them, not by interfering, but by trying to use our good offices and to say co collaboration really is important. So the new facility will involve uh, it'll be not less than 600,000 square feet. Uh, at least 200,000 square feet will be with uh, Baylor Research with, in areas of interest to us. And 100,000 square feet will be Methodist Research. They're, they're gearing up now. 
in areas of interest to us. You understand? It's not clinical research. This is called translational research, and a lot of our people are already doing it. Our bioengineers want to be over there right now. And as you may know, we have had these, we've had a series of raiding parties come from both coasts, from Duke and from, from Carnegie Mellon and from, from uh, universities out on the coast trying to take away our best young bioengineers. We've already repelled two of those raiding parties. And we're working very hard to make sure we don't lose anybody. Uh, absent that facility there, we lose them all. And that would be a huge disaster because the bioengineers are so hooked into the biosciences here, not just the people at the medical center, and to, and to the information scientists. You see, biology today is an information science. That's what it is. And we, we have the comparative advantage because we have the information and computational scientists and they know how to work with the clinicians. And that's what that building will be for. And it's coming. Uh, we'll, uh, Methodists will sign a long-term lease according to the letter. I mean, I'm not saying anything that the board wouldn't let me say. And we're working out the terms with Baylor. This is a win, 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 win proposition. UT Health Science Center will be involved in a small way with some stuff we're doing in nanotechnology, maybe 40,000 square feet. MD Anderson will be involved at least 25,000 square feet to start with in something we're already doing on the Comprehensive Cancer Center and to, with which we're, our information scientists and their cancer specialists are modeling the, uh, how cancer progresses and does not progress and how different medicines, uh, the molecular structure of different medicines can be used to combat cancer. We're already putting money into that anyway. I, see, I can instantly see all kinds of payoffs for research. Are there payoffs, uh, let's say, for undergraduate oh, yeah. education? Well, or for, are there any ways in there in which humanities and social science can also get involved? Can it, can it increase we, collaboration? Let me, too? I'll work from backwards. Uh, on We have already a pretty good start in ethics and medicine with Baruch Barodi. I see now nothing but that spanning, and I would hope that, that Baruch and, and uh, people like Baruch and, and who come along later would be housed in this new facility. It's a natural. And of course there's interest in Baylor and interest in joint appointment in Baylor. Uh, so definitely that. Uh, the students, of course, you, you do understand that we have uh, an, an incredibly high proportion of our seniors who go on to medical center, probably the highest proportion in the country. Uh, I forget now the figures, but I can tell you that of the uh, last year of the, our seniors who applied to medical school, all but one were admitted immediately, and more than two-thirds of them immediately admitted into their medical schools of first choice. Uh, but what the, the students, the one reason we have such a high proportion of really good students going on the medical center, because they're, they, they, the, the Baylor College of Medicine and MD Anderson want our students in their labs and they're already when they when when they're applying to medical school their CVs are already full of really good stuff so the, I don't think there's any I see joint classes uh, joint classes we're going to have the shuttle system worked out so that seamlessly we'll be able to transport people back and forth these are all things you know we've got really good people in finance and administration they're really competent They'll work all this stuff out. I, I don't ever try to micromanage this stuff. I say, here's what we want to do. You guys figure out how to do it. I don't even get involved in that. But, but I do say, here's what you need to do. And here's the resources needed to do it. Let me slightly, maybe more than slightly, switch the question here in the last 15 minutes or so. One of the things that you've done, I know you've written about this, is that you have, you have uh, very purposefully increase the authority of deans yes and giving them more money yeah, and more freedom could you say something about how you have in some sense decentralized power decision making yes uh, I think that universities uh, like ours particularly private universities who are endowment dependent and fundraising dependent uh, must have very very creative and resourceful deans to survive and prosper long term uh, we we had a period in which uh, the endowment insulated us from these things. And the deans did no fundraising to speak of, with some exceptions, like Kathy Matthews on federal money. Uh, and the deans uh, did, were not too concerned about trying to control costs. Because why? If they did, the university yanked it back at the end of the year. So anything that a dean did 
to try to conserve and save money for, uh, for purposes that the dean and the department chair and the faculty thought important were taken back at the end of the year. This is, now, this comes from my fiscal background, advising governments. Everywhere I went, I told governments to get rid of that practice because you know what will happen. You, you have the strangest phenomena in, say, in, 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 in Chile where at, on, on, September the, on, 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 on September the 30th, the fiscal year beginning uh, on October 1st, there would be immense purchases of Jeeps and silverware and you know, freezers. Why? Because to get, it, to get those, those balances off the books, because the, the government would simply reduce your appropriation the next year by that amount. That's ridiculous. So, so you read whole warehouses of materials that were bought for no purpose other than to keep them sending it back. Well, it's the same kind of thing here. Okay, so but they weren't the the, the, the deans weren't quite ready for this all at once. So the first year I said 25 percent goes back to the deans. The second year 33. So by now, two years ago, 100 percent of most categories goes back to the deans. Not all, but most. And uh, of the others, it's about 50 percent. And there are reasons for that. I won't get into the details. And We've been recruiting deans who could handle this, and now we have deans who can handle it. Uh, they get, you know, we say, this is back, use this for the priorities of your school. We don't, we don't know what your priorities are. We're here to try to help you work together, particularly on interdisciplinary stuff, and we're going to go out and find our resources. You come to us and tell us what your needs are, and we'll go search for them, but in the meantime, you are a better judge of what your needs are. So your present dean in humanities, he believes that your biggest problem right now is, the, uh, is in, at the graduate level and stipends. Well, fine. He's getting to keep a hell of a lot of money, and he's plowing it back into there. And we think it'll work. But we're not going to tell him. We're not going to micromanage him. Okay? We're going to try to create conditions under which resourceful, creative people can do their best work. But not, we don't have any idea that we have a better idea how to, to do pure math than the mathematicians, or to do philosophy better than the philosophers. And I think that process is complete now. I it's really an think it's extremely positive change. Yeah. Let me ask you another question. I realize that you did not, this was a role that the board also was very much involved in, but clearly the nature of the board has changed, Yeah. both in terms of the geographical location of the board and the sort of makeup of the board. Could you say something about how the, the impact you see that kind of change having on Rice's future? Well. You know, the board, uh, the, the Rice's boards have been of immense benefit to Rice uh, the, from the very beginning. They made the decision that they were going to take the legacy from Mr. Rice and build it before they opened the university. And build it, they did. Of course, you know that a lot of the money for the original construction came from Harvest of Timber, just like in the old English universities. Uh, but they took that thing and built it. They made decisions such as in 1940 when they bought the Rincon field. And of course the board turned it down and Mr. George Brown just bought it himself. And then the next year he convinced the board they really should buy it. And that field has been producing, it was already producing for eight years in 1940. And I'm 63 and I was born in 1940, so it's been almost 70 years. And El Rincon has given rice uh, the equivalent of several billion dollars, if you in today's money, okay, not in not in the monies of the of the past, but if you inflate those from the past, it's several billion dollars, and that was a master stroke. Uh, the way that they have ma managed our timber properties, the way they have managed our endowment, has always been immensely positive. As you know, there was a bad hiccup in the '60s when the board, <laughs> the, in the selection of a president. And of course, you've you've written about that, and uh, I'm not, you know, you, you can fill everybody in on that. But I think a lot was learned, a lot was learned, and the board, the, our board, from that day forward, has known how to be a board, and they've let the president, they've tried to find presidents who knew how to be presidents, and the president doesn't try to do the board's job, and the board doesn't try to do the president's job, and that's that's heaven because I will tell you that there are many campuses, including private universities, where those lessons have never been learned to the everlasting despair of sitting presidents. I'm, I have never had despair one day on this job about board, uh, uh, board uh, uh, intrusion into things that, uh, that the board agrees was a job of the president and the faculty. Okay, never, never once. Well, originally the board had seven members, and for then it expanded in a variety of ways. 
but there were, there were very precise geographical limitations on that board. At first, they had to be all in Harris County. Mm -hmm. and then there could be one or two outside of Harris County. But now the board is much broader, yeah. and there are people from the East Coast and the West Coast and from Chicago, mm -hmm. and people have international education, international experience. Mm -hmm. So in yeah. some ways, the board has internationalized exactly what you yeah. to call for right yeah. and, and it, It's a process that has come to fruition, and it began a while back. Charles Duncan really started it. When Charles said, okay, there are two classes because of the legal structure of the university. There's trustees and then there's board members. But Charles, certainly from the day I came, never, when he took a vote, never distinguished between trustees and board members. Never. Okay. And, and this, this was a necessary process. You couldn't just change it. Of course, the law, we had, we had to go sue right. the attorney general. And when Bill came in, he said, well, now let's just... Let's, let's make de jure what Charles has made de facto. And while we're at it, let's try to expand the board so that we are now an institution of, a, of national and international dimensions. Let's expand the board that way and let's make sure also that we have a board more representative of this country and our society. And both of those things have happened. All of those things have happened. Very, again, very, very positive yes. elements. And once again, you see a university working on the problem. They were working the problem. When they, then they got consensus, and they moved ahead. We don't have much time left, and I had two questions to ask. One question was to ask you to talk about your sense of the library. There was a lot of discussion here a few years ago of a major yeah. enhancement of the library, and for complicated reasons that you've explained before, we backed away a little bit from that. But let me, before time's up, let me ask you this question. I think there, I get the sense on the campus mm -hmm. that uh, the School of Engineering is a school that at present is not the school that it maybe should be or could be. The Rice for years has been known for engineering. What do you see as, what, what needs to be done? What is the future of well, the School of Engineering? Engineering as a discipline and as a practice has changed more since 1950 than just about any any academic undertaking I can think of. Uh, I would say though that if there's a perception of weakness they're not looking at our assets in computational and biomedical because we are really good in those areas and we've had the good sense to recognize. Let me tell you a story. Uh, about Two and a half years ago, a trustee from Chicago, who was the head of their capital campaign a few years ago, uh, came to see me because he had about $10 million. He was getting ready to invest in one of our spinoffs in nanotechnology. So he said, tell me, what in science and engineering, where have you, th this university, decided to place its bets? And I said, oh, well, that's pretty easy. Nano, bio, and info. He said, gee, three home runs and three at-bats. And he was right. Okay, we have been focused. We have been very, and you add Enviro to that too. We have been focused. Uh, the fields of civil and mechanical have been evolving. Electrical has, a, has evolved right along with computer and, and other engineering. Uh, and, and civil and mechanical have evolved. And there are many very, very strong schools of civil engineering across this country. Illinois, for example. Uh, there are many strong departments of mechanical engineering. Uh, you have to understand that we're in Houston, Texas. We're at the world center of energy technology. We're right across the street from all this vibrant stuff in biomedicine. It makes a lot of sense for us to focus on computational and uh, uh, engineering and biomedical engineering and on, on the nanobio interface. It makes us a lot of sense. But we cannot do all things equally well. You have to be of a certain scale to do to have to be a full service civil engineering place. Okay, we're not that big, and we've been evolving that way. There may be a perception that we have turned our backs on civil and part of mechanical. No, it's been part of the natural evolution that we see at Rice being a flexible place. Well, I think it makes the point as you said earlier that departments, if they're if they're rigid, can ossify a university. Uh -huh. And the, de and the engineering has been an area in which the hottest fields now didn't exist 20 years ago. And fields that were very important 70 years That's ago right. are not so much now. So in some sense, we need to sort of break down the kind of ways which we have departments organized to represent, yeah. not to, to reflect not only the changing field, but also our particular 
situation here in Houston. Have you ever heard my lecture on the evolution of disciplines? Don't think so. Well, I begin by speaking of history and Josephus. I'm, and I'm recorded history goes back yeah, beyond begin, Josephus. Okay. But you begin early then. Huh? You begin early. You begin early. And then I start, but I work through and I start talking about the ancient discipline of economics. How ancient is it? Well, the first economics department was at Harvard in 1880, and it was clergy. Okay? Uh, anthropology and sociology and political science didn't exist then. They evolved some, sometimes from economics departments and others. These are all 20, tw early 20th century disciplines. Okay? Uh, we, there, are, there are lessons there. There are lessons there. Uh, it, it may be we're seeing again convergence in some of the social sciences and humanities. I don't know. I, and I, I don't think anyone has to direct it. I think that we can count on creative and resourceful faculty. But if we have if we have institutional rules that prevent them from doing what they need to do, that's the problem. And that's where tough leadership comes in handy. And that's why you really need a good provost who is willing to, to, to break some eggs to make an omelet. President too, but the provost has got to be the one on the scene to do that. And this, if you look around and you'll see universities that are flexible and nimble, you'll see that a good provost has been selected. Now, of course, the problem is you get, you get one selected and somebody else wants them as a president. So about five or six years is the most you can count on keeping one. So you better make good use of them while you got them. So I guess I could say here that engineering is an area in which because of changes in the disciplines and changes oh, yeah. in, that, that they require unusual flexibility and that in some sense Rice has always been nimble. So in yes. some sense this need actually plays into one of our characteristics. Rice has always been nimble. Uh, we were known for a long, long time as being, turning out <clears throat> the engineering graduates who had the best theoretical basis of any in the country. Okay, and this made them, and when they got out, and, and it made them fast on their feet. And look what happened to some of them. Look what happened. They went to Palo Alto. And you got your Burt McMurchers, and you got your Bob Maxfields, and you got your Ushmans, and you got hundreds of, not hundreds, but dozens of others. Why? And they all got graduate degrees once they got out there and started working. Why? Because they were really well prepared. But you don't pick up the theory on your own. You've got to interact with people. Okay? And so uh, we were unusual that way then. We were unusual in the sense that w w the first computer at Rice was made by people putting together uh, different pieces of scrap. <laughs> A lot of resourcefulness. How, how much time do we have when you're family? Oh, I've got four minutes. Maybe five. Uh, I don't think it's time to really talk about the library. Anything we, you've had, we've talked two hours. Very well, wait, wait, we can we can talk about the library. But that, if you only got four minutes left, Paul, is that is that what I mean? I'm very interested. Well, in the all, library, but one of the, I can I, I can use half of that. Okay. Uh, people should rest assured that we're going ahead. We the, our our original plans. People don't. May, may, not, may, or may, may or may not believe this, but our original plans were formulated without knowledge of our facility out on Main Street, our 38 acres, and we really were turning a blind eye to the floodplain. I was in waist deep water on the morning of the floods at Allison, and I walked across, I got back to campus and waded through, and as I passed the, the library, I said, there's no way we're going underground now. There's no way in the world we can put books down there. The whole thing has got to be rethought. We're a mature enough institution where nobody minded saying we almost made a big mistake, and we almost did. In the meantime, but that meant we, we had to start over. We have started over with the facility. Have you been out there? The, yes, the, I've been out there. The, for the temporary facility. We're now starting, uh, I think, uh, uh, you'll, if you, this is next board meeting, we're going to talk now about uh, architects and others to give us the new concept for, for Fondren. Uh, in the meantime, we have gotten p uh, faculty out of the library and put them into Herring and Razor, liberating space. So uh, we're way ahead of the game. But we did have to rethink what we were doing. We almost made a huge mistake. And of course, the, pro the project grew from $80 million to $130. I'm Having done work in major projects around the world, I, can, I know how this happens. It gets away from you. It, the project just grows. And it went from 80 and it got to 100 and I said to the board, where are we going to get the money? They got to 125, where did it, and then 130. It got out of hand. It grew in size, but it also grew down. The 80 million was not underground, so it, it got a lot costlier, yep. and in some sense, yep. less practical. Well, all of us, you know, we, we all of us had a hand in almost making a big mistake. We didn't make that mistake, and in the end, the humanities and the social sciences and all people who are intensive uses 
of the modern library are going to benefit. Is it one, two other things? One, two more minutes or something mm -hmm. else? It's up to you. Okay, well, I was going to say, is there anything that you would have liked to say or you wished I had asked? Oh, I wished you to ask. Well, you know, we've talked just about just about everything. If, if uh, you know, it's like Eisenhower once said about Nixon, is he presidential timber? And Eisenhower, well, give me a couple of weeks and I'll. <laughs> well, what about what, so next year you'll take a leave? A leave. I do. You'll go back to North Carolina to your farm. Yeah. And I guess, I don't know, you'll slop pigs and what to egg patch. And, and then I'll, after uh, that, you what, will you come back to Rice? Oh, yeah, yes, as a university uh, professor. And I'll, I've been asked your, to teach in history and economics yeah. and a business school, and I, I did a lot of work in energy. So some in engineering, and I'm really looking forward to it. With these students you've got, graduate and undergraduate, I, they're they're really stimulating. Right. If you don't like to teach at Rice, you're in the wrong business. No, and I was just looking at a young man who is uh, we're looking at in engineering, who's who got two degrees from MIT and one from Berkeley, and everybody wants him, but we want him worse than anybody because he's expressed a strong interest in teaching as well. He's going to he's going to be a uh, his expertise is in modeling biological systems and engineering, okay? And his basis for a lot of his work in genetics, but he's interested in teaching. I told Gene a few minutes ago, our provost, get him, whatever it takes, get him. It's, and he's just get it, just finishing his postdocs. Great, great. Well, thanks very much. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Perfect. I mean, I, did you think it went well? I mean, you, oh, yeah, yeah. I think you covered basically. Yeah. You cover a lot of material in two hours. Yeah, well, there are other things we can talk about, but I just don't know what they are. Right. Well, I, I thought it went through what you wrote to yeah. sort of pick out the yeah. things that I, you know, they're yeah. clearly good. So, uh, what do you? Uh, we'll have we'll make copies of this and have them in the woods. And do, do you want any kind of restriction, or do you want to no. see them No. 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 Oh, I can't imagine anybody being upset. They ought to be inspired. I mean, I said nothing hurtful. And that would be the only thing right. that I would uh, worry about. Other than that, I'm not afraid of being wrong. Right. I'm not afraid of having things blow up in my face. Right. Right. This happened a lot. Right.